I'm Sari Kimball, and I've done just about everything in the food industry. I have helped hundreds of packaged food business entrepreneurs, and now I want to help you make your delicious dream a reality. Whether you want to be successful at farmer's markets, online, or wholesale onto store shelves, food business success is your secret ingredient. I will show you how to avoid an expensive hobby and instead run a profitable food business. Now let's jump in. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast. I hope you enjoyed the first episode in the series all about connecting with your customers. And that interview with Katie was so great. And I'm excited to continue the conversation with Anna Bradshaw in this interview today. And I do have a confession to make. <laughs> and I, I should apologize. I'm going to apologize on air here for Anna. Uh, she and I recorded this episode way back in January of 2020. And for various reasons, it just kind of kept sitting on the shelf and I had other topics I wanted to talk about. And then it all just worked that this month really seemed like a great time to focus on your customer. And I have to say it was really fun going back and listening to this. I got so much out of it. <laughs> so I guess that's a good, um, that it stands the test of time because what we talk about in here is pure gold. So I will just get right to it and off we go. And so I'm very excited to welcome Anna Bradshaw with us today. Anna is a copywriter and content strategist specializing in website copy and email marketing for independent CPG brands. And that's you. If you make a package product, you are a CPG brand. She loves marketing strategy so much that it's not just her job, it's also her hobby too. You'll likely catch her spending her weekends with a book in hand and a notebook open beside her. Anna's approach combines data-driven research with a proven copywriting process to create rich and flavorful brand messages. Welcome, Anna. Well, thanks so much for having me, Sari. I'm looking forward to our chat today. Yes, this is such a great topic because we were talking um, before we started recording that either I find that people really get this piece around their brand identity and brand story, and they, they do such a great job and you can really see how it carries through in their whole presentation, whether it's in person at a farmer's market or their emails or their website. And then the ones that we, I'm sure you have that too, where I feel like I'm just dragging them along and trying to convince them that this is really, really important. So tell us a little bit more about what you do and how you got into, I love that you are focused on the CPG industry before we jump in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, honestly, I picked CPG because I'm kind of an avid consumer myself. I love discovering delicious new treats at the store and admiring gorgeous packaging and wonderful brands from, um, you know, skincare and beauty and food brands and kind of watching that space and how newcomers can really make a big impact with a new product offering and a really great brand. So um, that's kind of how I got into this specific niche, but I've always um, been sort of adjacent to marketing or sales with a background in nonprofit and higher education, as well as enterprise level sales. And all of them really share key threads. You're trying to get someone to make a decision and to usually part with some of their money, um, whether it's for a good cause or to enjoy your product. Absolutely. I mean, I think pretty much that's a whole other conversation, but people are so scared to like, Ultimately, we are asking for people to open their wallet and pay you money for your product. And are you delivering value in some way that makes the customer say, yes, I want this product in exchange for giving up some of my money. Exactly. Yes. So it's not a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, let's talk first about... Uh, I think it's a great way to, because we're going to talk about your website and email strategy, but let's talk first about why you need a brand identity, why you need a brand story, and maybe you can give us some good examples of, of brands who do this well, because I think, especially with this, examples will be really helpful for people. 
Yes, absolutely. Well, you need a great brand because every space you're in is crowded with competitors. Even if you have a product that's never been seen before, that's never been done before, totally one of a kind, it still has a lot of competitors. And that might be someone just sticking with the older version. So if you have a keto cereal, um, you know, you might say, oh, it's the first of its kind and there are several. But as an example, this is a, like a newer product to the space, right? It's like, how could a cereal also be keto? Well, you could have one that's delicious and wonderful, but people could choose to either stick with their traditional grain cereals or they could choose to stick with a more traditional keto diet that doesn't include cereal. So even if you think that you're free of competitors, you still have, um, consumers still have a choice to make, to choose you or something else. Um, and for most of us, there are some more similar products in this space already. If you're starting a new chocolate brand, there are already hundreds of them. And you need to stand out and tell a story um, you know, because we do have so many options in our grocery stores and especially online now, um, it's more important than ever to tell your unique story and show people how your chocolate is different, how your flavors are different um, than everyone else out there. And uh, you can definitely see some people winning at this and others who miss the mark. But some good examples. Um, I, one of my clients is Beauty Bar Chocolate, and this is um, Candace developed a chocolate that doesn't have any sugar in it, um, so it's very healthy. And she also, from the beginning, put in collagen to give it, you know, more like skin benefits and more, you know, beauty from the inside out kind of benefits. And so she tells that story. It's not just regular chocolate; it's chocolate with these added benefits. Um, and similarly, um, I think th there's a few ways that you can choose to stand out. So Beauty Bar Chocolate does it with their ingredients and also with the founder's personal story. Jenny's Ice Cream does it with the founder's personal story and really um, fun and unique flavors and a different approach to flavors. Uh, Belgian Boys Waffles is a brand I love to follow they have a very strong brand aesthetic. So their colors, their design, their logo, it's all very cohesive and very different from Ego or other snack brands that are out there. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and you can look, you know, I would just encourage people to go to the grocery store, look at categories, especially crowded categories like chocolate, like energy bars, mm -hmm. ice cream, um, cereals are a good one, hot sauce and salsa. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm in Colorado. So when, uh, when I get new, like, oh no, one more hot sauce. Oh gosh, <laughs> we have so many here. Um, but really look at, yeah, like what is the story and do they have an identity that that is, can you recognize it? And in uh, Food Business Success, when we do branding and brand identity and story, we start with um, like identity personality traits as a way to mm -hmm. like start that conversation. So I always say, who would I meet if I met your brand at uh, a cocktail party? Remember those things that we used to be able to do? <laughs> we used to go to parties. <laughs> I know. But who would I meet at there? And so we have a whole list of attributes and personalities. So it could be, you know, coffee is another good one where you can really see like, is somebody trying to be like rebellious or um, hipster or witty or, uh, you know, more soft and feminine and, mm -hmm. and those kind of traits. So I'm assuming you kind of start with something like that when you're helping to, to create a, a story from the beginning. Absolutely. And there's kind of two sides of it. You start with who you are as a brand. And I love that you personify it. It's so much easier to think of it that way. Um, you know, if your brand was a person, you know, what, you know, would they be cheerful and bubbly and outgoing? Would they be more serious? Um, it can even help, you know, they're easy prompts to do with this. What 
famous people <laughs> would your brand yeah, um, sound like laugh. when they're speaking? <laughs> yeah, would it be like the educated um, or the very you know intellectual professor, or would it be your best friend next door? Um, you know, is it the comedian on TV? Um, and that is a really great place to start and, you know, use those adjectives and those feeling words um, to start with the brand identity. And then I think there's another really important side of it, and that's what's your unique value proposition um, and what are you offering your customers? Because especially today when there's so many good looking brands and there's so many well-designed brands out there, you can't just look good. You have to offer um, really great value that people care about. Um, so whether that's your ingredient list or your unique flavors or how, you know, maybe you have a portable um, version of something that's usually, you know, you have to make at home, or maybe you have more sustainable packaging that ties in with your consumer's desire to be more, you know, um, sustainable. You have to find those values and those needs that your customers have, and then really offer that value upfront and make it a part of your brand story. Yeah, hundred percent. I call that being defensively unique. And, you know, I, I do get a lot of people that say, well, I don't know. It's just, you know, it's salsa or <laughs> it's mm. like, it's just good. And so sometimes we have to dig a little bit deeper and um, really, yeah, what, what are the things that are going to set you apart um, in a crowded, in a crowded space, right? Wherever your sales channels are. So super important to, to think through what value are you offering? Because yeah, a customer has so many choices. And often, uh, you know, when you're starting now, when you're a startup, you can't compete on price. So that's right. just off the table. <laughs> yeah. so you need something else. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I find too, it can help to look at brands outside of your space. If you're looking for inspiration, if you're just feeling yes, stuck, I agree. Um, you know, look at, Brands like Rothy's or Allbirds, you know, shoe brands that are totally unrelated to food, um, but see how they're presenting value in a way that instantly connects and uh, resonates with their customers. Yeah. And I'm looking actually at the Beauty Bar Chocolate site and it's beautiful and you can really see how... I mean, every that brand story really carries through from the packaging to the text, the fonts, um, the imagery. You know who mm -hmm. the the people are in in the photos. So, yeah, great, great job uh, <laughs> on the work on that. But um, so those are some good examples of, of brand story. And I I think you know sometimes people see large, large names, big brands. And they're like, well, how, you know, I'm just starting out. How on earth do I do that? But I, I think that there are, are very small ways. You don't have to come out super professional out of the gate, but things like on your, on your Instagram or as you're taking photos and the things that you use on your website, I mean, it needs to come through consistently. Are we, um, mm -hmm. are we talking to our customer, which maybe we should back up and say, let's just talk about that actually for a second, because yeah, do you see that as a as a pain point with with folks that sometimes they aren't always putting their customer first? It is, you know, it's hard when you're so close to your own brand and your own product, um, and it's easy, especially if you're in a hurry. You know, it's hard to devote big chunks of time to writing your messages for every Instagram post. And so it's easy to fall back into um, a pattern of just saying what the product is or making your announcement or talking about yourself without remembering to always put it through a lens of why does my customer care? And it's not that your customer is just selfish and they don't care about you, but they are in a hurry. And like we said, they're parting with their money. So they're looking for brands that give them value. So that can be, you know, a recipe that, you know, you know, some of your customers are going to really appreciate that's free value for them that they can enjoy. Or, um, you know, just saying what's great about your new co-packing 
facility that will let you sell more or saying, okay, we're going to be at the farmer's market this coming Saturday and you can pick up, you know, and list the top selling products that you know they'll love or something that you haven't had for a while that, you know, you're going to be able to sell again this weekend. Um, you know, whether it's big or small, share every message through the lens of why does my customer care? How does this help them? Yeah, that's so good. And I will actually state it a little bit stronger. You were trying to be really nice, but I don't think your customer <laughs> cares about you as a person, <laughs> unless it's like your mom. Um, but your general customer, they only care about themselves. And we are selfish um, to some extent, or we're thinking about the other people around us. But most of us are not putting ourselves in, in the producer's shoes. We're just looking for a product that's going to solve a problem in our lives or, or make our lives better. And so I think sometimes people get into this thinking it is all about them and, and making that shift about like when it gets time to sell your product and to start putting a, a website out there and doing social media and sending emails so important to make this switch to say, what does my customer want to hear from me? And and we drill down to creating one single customer avatar and and you always keep that person in mind that, you know, Susie <laughs> wants to hear this message and I'm writing this message for Susie. And so getting really specific in your brand story with a customer and your identity will really help you to, I mean, really it's about consistency, I guess, to go yes. back. To what I was saying earlier, it's like your copywriting, your Instagram post, your photography, like who you have in the photos, will it appeal to your customer and um, carrying that all the way through? Yeah. And, you know, it's worth taking the time to go through these exercises and create that avatar. And once you do, don't let it just sit in your Google Drive and collect dust. Print it out or pull it up on your desktop home screen and have it within eyesight um, because it is so easy to lose focus when you are you know, multitasking and wearing multiple hats in your business. Um, it'll be, you'll be surprised at just a simple thing like keeping it within eyesight will make a big difference and help you stay consistent. Such a good tip. I highly recommend doing that because you'll it'll force you to remember, yeah, who you're doing this for and and the messages that you're crafting. Um, while you while we're all very busy, but it'll keep that person uh, front of mind. All right, so we have a brand story. Um, we're communicating our value proposition. So really, I guess, and we talked a little bit about them already, but let's dive into them. So really, it's your website. And then it's any kind of communication that you're doing with a customer. So email and probably social media, would you say are the main ones? Yeah. And even, even ads, if you're running ads, um, even your banner at your farmer's market stand, everything really. But the things that, you know, you want to invest the time and get it right on your website first. I find that once you have a strong website, it's easy for you to use the same messages and the same, you know, benefits and phrasing um, across, you know, your Instagram and Facebook and emails. Um, so once you get a good base, then it's easy to go from there to keep things consistent. Yes, absolutely. And and like you said, sometimes it can be so difficult to see the forest from the trees. You're so close to it that I think this is an area getting some outside perspective can be so helpful. Yeah, definitely. And that's what I love helping my clients with. I can come in as a more, you know, objective outside party and help because as a founder, it is so, um, you know, it, it can be overwhelming, I think. And if it's not overwhelming, that's great. So, I'm, you know, depending what you've done for work in the past or your own natural inclinations, this might come as second nature or it might feel awkward and difficult and either way is okay. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk first about uh, your e-commerce your or your website pages um, and jump into uh, your work with websites and how you help, you know, what, what are some of your recommendations for building up a, a great website with um, that brand story? Yeah. So your website is like two things. It's 
one, telling your story and letting people know like what your brand is all about in a very like nice, engaging way. But secondly, it's about making it easy for people to buy from you. And sometimes that stuff is less fun and less exciting, but it's really, really important because just having a pretty website isn't enough. You need to make it so that people um, get their questions answered and have an easy path to check out um, or an easy path to finding their local market that is selling your brand right now. Yep, 100%. Uh, it needs to be about that user experience as well as the beautiful <laughs> images and, and copywriting. Yeah, totally. So, um, you know, there are a few things with that. Your website copy could be pretty brief and concise, or it could be more engaging and long. And I think um, it's helpful to keep in mind your experience that you've had selling face to face. So if you've ever sold at a farmer's market or, you know, talked with your friends and family and tried to get them to understand what your product is, um, what questions were they asking you? Were they asking about what does this really taste like? Were they asking, can I put this jam in baked goods or is it only for toast? Um, what are all the questions that people have and what are sort of the reasons they shy away? Are they shying away from taking a free sample because they don't usually like mustard, even though your mustard is totally different than other one, everyone out there? Or you know, if it's a hot sauce, are they really too hot or are they very picky and think it's not hot enough? Um, you know, what are all the questions and hesitations people have had that you know of? And then make sure that you answer and address every single one of them on your site. That's great. So what do you suggest I should put on a homepage? I mean, do I put all of that there? Do I put my products? Like what's some of the nitty gritty of a homepage? What do you recommend? Yeah, think of it, you know, it's like the front entryway of your house or like your um, first elevator pitch if you're meeting a, you know, someone in an elevator, what's the first thing that you'd say to them? So that should somehow communicate your unique value proposition, um, whether that's, you know, gluten-free breads for picky eaters or gluten-free flour for baking bread or whatever that thing is, make it very clear what you're selling on your homepage. And you can get into a little bit of your brand story without making it too extensive. Give a little blurb, tell a little bit about who you are, and then get to the benefits and showcase the benefits of your products. Um, there are a lot of templates for especially like the default ones that you're likely seeing if you're just setting up your first um, Shopify or your site um, where all the products are just sort of listed on the front page without much copy. And that works for Amazon, that works for walmart.com, but you aren't either one of those. You're not selling to the same kind of audience, or if you are, it's not in the same way. They're looking for something different from you. You have to tell them what makes your, um, your hot sauce special instead of just listing all the varieties right on that homepage. Um, you can have them on there. Just make sure that there's an introduction first before people scroll to see what you're selling. Um, that's, that's how you generally approach homepages, but there are other things to keep in mind too. So, the number one thing you want someone to do is buy your product on your site. The second thing, if they're not going to be ready to buy, not everyone is, then you want them to sign up for your email list so that you can cultivate the relationship and get to know them and they can get to know you. Um, so make sure that you make it really easy for people to sign up for your list and again, a lot of templates put this in the footer 
which is fine, but you should also have it higher on the page. Don't hide it away. Make it pretty prominent so that people um, can see it. And we can get into this if you want, but there's different incentives you can offer. We're used to seeing discounts. You don't have to do a discount, but discounts do work and they can be a great way to get that first order right away and capture someone's email address as well. If they're not yeah. quite ready to buy. So important to get that email. And I still have people question me and say, come on, I hate all those emails I get. And I don't want to get people's emails. It feels spammy or <laughs> um, like, does email really work? And yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, email does work. Um, and it's really about, like you said, we own the relationship when you have the email from your customer and you can continue to nurture that. And providing some kind of value is typically, you know, it's very normal on a homepage, whether it's a discount or a recipe or, you know, something interesting. And so I would encourage people to think about maybe a discount doesn't work for you right now, but is there another piece of value that you can offer in exchange for their email? Because our emails are very valuable to us, right? <laughs> A lot of yes, us don't yeah. like to sign up for a million things and get get all those emails. And then well, and it goes back to value too, right? Like people want value in exchange for their email address. They're not just looking for more emails <laughs> to subscribe to. Um, so yeah, give value, and there, you know, it can be different things. It can be special access to new upcoming products. It can be um, not just a, a percentage discount, but the chance to get a bundle or buy in a more bulk rate that comes with a built-in discount. It could be, you know, the promise of an once a year birthday gift. Um, and recipes are, you know, a great way to add instant value that doesn't cost you anything, especially after you create it the first time. Um, but it, it can give uh, your customers, you know, a reason to sign up for those emails. And yeah, remember, especially if you're paying to get traffic to your site, if you're running any kind of ads or if you're doing PR work to try to get links out there to your site, and then you're not capturing email addresses when people are on your site, you're just going to have to spend those dollars over and over and over again. Um, Whereas if you get someone's email, you can follow up with them and when they're ready to buy, you know, they'll, they'll already know your name and be more familiar with you from seeing you pop up in their inbox. Not like, what was that one site I went to two months ago? They don't remember. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so good. All right. So we actually collect their email. We have a great home home website, our homepage. Um, we're following, we're consistent with our brand identity and telling a brand story. Um, obviously we're making it easy for people to buy our products and have a product, a great product page, but we get that email, whether it's through, um, a pop-up or, you know, offering value or certainly if somebody buys, um, uh, so let's shift over to email strategy and, you know, a lot of people, uh, collect that email and then it goes into the black hole and nothing, <laughs> and, and nothing really happens with it. So what, you know, what do you recommend? We've talked that email is important. What, what next? Yeah, definitely don't let them go into the black hole. What you can do is you can set up an automated welcome sequence and all you do is set it up once and then it keeps running forever or until you want to update it. Um, and that ensures that you're not just leaving your subscribers hanging because that first moment, the first day that they sign up for your emails is when they're when you know that they're really interested in your brand. And if you wait a week, two weeks, a month, before they get an email from you, that's too much time elapsed. They're already you know, going to forget and be like, oh, who is this? What hot sauce? What was this? I don't remember signing up for this. Um, whereas that first day, they're already interested. You know it. You can trust that they're interested because they did give you their email. Um, so it's important to keep sharing value right away. So I work with clients to set up usually a three to five 
five emails is usually a good number of emails for a welcome sequence, but they can definitely be much, much longer. But you can start with one email. You know, one is better than none. <laughs> when, in, yes. when it comes to email, <laughs> one is better than none. Um, any email is better than no email. But your welcome sequence is a great chance to go more in depth with sharing the value that you offer your customers. So you can send one email that tells more of your story, again, through that lens of you know, what it does for your customer. Um, you can also suggest a first purchase for someone. So if you have a line of you know, meat jerky snacks and you find that um, people aren't quite sure about the salmon, it's a little more of a niche flavor, but pretty much everyone loves the beef jerky, well then recommend that. Or if you have um, a line of herbal teas and you have you know, your chamomile is far and away your best seller, send an email letting people know that's your best seller. People love you know, hopping on the bandwagon of, oh, other people are buying this, then it must be good. Um, and another thing that's a missed opportunity for a lot of startups You'll see big brands do this, but startups sometimes miss it, is sharing social proof via email. And social proof is just, you know, that, oh, I see Siri's drinking this brand of tea. That looks good. I'm going to trust that it's good and, and try it myself. Um, so usually social, social proof is other reviews. Whether or not you have a whole bunch on your site, it's worth it to always be collecting reviews. So maybe I love I should that. that. Yeah. You should have reviews on your site, but sometimes it takes a while, you know, for them to build up when you're just getting started. Yeah. Um, but as soon as you get in those reviews, put them, you know, get your customer's permission, but put them in an email and send them out as part of the welcome sequence. And it can have a subject line like see what people are saying about Kimball herbal teas. And then let other people say, see, oh, wow, people are saying they're delicious. I was worried they'd be bitter, but it looks like they're delicious. Um, and that, yeah. that can do a lot for your brand. For sure. I mean, we think of, I mean, I think you're right that this definitely gets missed by startups. Uh, but this is how we buy. We go to Amazon mm -hmm. and read the reviews. We look on social media, right? We we do care about yeah. those testimonials a lot. And even if you just have to start with friends and family <laughs> at the mm -hmm. beginning, that's fine. Just have, you know, on your website, I think it's important to have that. But I, I love that. I hadn't really thought about turning it into part of your email sequence. That's great. Yeah, you can definitely do this, not just in your welcome sequence, but, you know, every once in a while, send out another one with some fresh reviews, you know, as long as they're honest and legit reviews, share them and keep sharing them because they make a big difference, especially if you can't do in-person sampling um, and, you know, people are discovering you online and, and can't just get like a free sample to see what your product tastes like or how it really performs in, in recipes and stuff. Yeah. So, so three to five is ideal. Um, I love that. Yeah. Sharing social proof, sharing your story. Like you said, that is a place where first you make it about your customer, but once they get to know you, they're like, oh, I want to learn more about you. So that's an okay time <laughs> to make it about you. And then um, sharing about other people and then kind of going in for that last like okay, you know, here's a discount or here's mm -hmm. something to help, you know, incentivize you to make that, that first purchase. Is that kind of usually how you end the sequence? Yeah, especially if there wasn't an initial discount code, or even if you do send a discount code in your first email, you can remind people. Um, and depending what email software you're using, there are different levels of automation to make this super simple so that it can send a unique code. And then once that code is used, once it's done, so you don't have to worry about people like forwarding it to all their friends or going back and using it over and over. Sure. Uh, and I'm sure people will ask, so do you have some email platforms that you recommend um, that you usually use with your clients? 
Yeah, so I always recommend Klaviyo. They have really great automations and they make it easy for you to set up these flows like your welcome sequence and you know abandoned cart, thank you. Um, it might seem like a lot, but they really do make it simple and easy. And they also let you test different things, which I think is really important. They have A, B testing features where you could test different subject lines and see what works better or different messages within the email. Um, and it connects directly with Shopify in a really great way. So if you're using Shopify, it's seamless and really awesome. Um, if you're just starting your email list and it feels overwhelming to, or if, if you just can't invest right now in email, um, you know, I use a free MailChimp account for my own email list and it's very basic and rudimentary, but it works. So something is better than nothing. And there are lots of different good software platforms out there. I just find Klaviyo to be my personal favorite. Yeah, I've heard other people recommend uh, Klaviyo uh, that are large, a little bit, you know, they've grown beyond the the farmer's market stage or, you know, they're on Amazon, they're on um, doing a great e-commerce business. But I agree. I think you can start out with MailChimp, although they've taken away a lot of features um, in the free yeah. version, which is unfortunate, including the yeah. scheduling, which... Mm -hmm. Um, that kind of stinks, but <laughs> so you have to be present to send the email, at least that those one-off emails, but they do have some automation in the free version. And I noticed that Shopify has, um, some new features within Shopify, but I haven't actually used those before with the automated emails. Yeah, I haven't either, but I think they have, yeah, they're a good e-commerce platform too. So it'll, uh, it'll get you through anyway, until you're ready mm -hmm. to, to do the paid um, Clavio. Exactly. Um, all right. So welcome sequence. That's when people give you their email. Um, we won't go into it too much, but abandon cart sequence. So that's when people put something in their cart and then walk away. I'm sure we've all gotten those. <laughs> hey, mm -hmm. <laughs> did you forget about me? <laughs> you know, and, those can be really annoying and um, you, you have to decide how much you want to use them in your own brand, but they do bring in revenue for the companies I've seen. So if you're skipping them because you think, oh, that's that's too like I don't too nosy, they'll feel like they're being spied on. You know, people are used to them and they do work. Yes. And, you know, on your website, you have a, you know, a recommendation or something that you, you did with a client that they recaptured 26 K in revenue for a brand w with a new abandoned cart sequence. So there's no question yeah. that those do work. <laughs> they work. Yep. <laughs> Cause we've all done it where we got distracted and walked away and then we're like, Oh yeah, I did want mm -hmm. that actually. <laughs> That pair of shoes that's in my cart. Yes, I did want those. Yes. <laughs> and then where do you use, is the thank you sequence after someone buys? Is that the? Yeah. So after someone purchases your product, usually they'll get some automatic emails from, you know, Shopify or whatever platform you use, just saying like order confirmation. Um, and then they might also get shipping updates. And those are all great. That's really helpful information for your customers, but it helps to go a step further and send a more personal feeling thank you, especially if it's someone's first time buying from you. Um, but even if, even if they're a regular customer, it's nice to say thank you. And it makes your customer feel a little bit more connected with you. And it can do a few other things as well. It can get them ready for when your product arrives because I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll buy something maybe a little spur of the moment online. And then, especially lately with sh slower shipping, by the time it arrives, I've forgotten that I ordered it or um, forgotten exactly how I meant to use it. So it's um, really helpful to have an email come in, you know, maybe it's a week after the order. This is something that you set up in your email software software, how long the lag time is, but maybe it's a week after and it says, hey, here are three recipes for using our spice blend that you're about to get. Or, 
hey, FYI, when you, here's the best way to brew our coffee. So when you get it, you have the best possible experience with it. And this info should probably be on your site too. But again, people aren't going to remember to go back to your site or they're not going to remember, oh yeah, I bought this spice blend because it said I could use it, you know, with chicken or in my salad dressings. Um, so, so help people get ready to use your product and get the most benefit from your product. Yes. So good. I love that follow up. Yeah. Like here's how you can use our product. I'm actually working with um, a new brand. Uh, it, they're called Best Assure and it's a, it's a Worcestershire sauce, which mm-hmm. already has a nice pun in there. It actually took me a minute, <laughs> but <laughs> um, you know, go for the best, not the worst. I love that. <laughs> That's great. And um, they've done such a great job. I, you know, we're just getting their e-commerce pieces set up and getting them an actual product because uh, they've been making it out of their their home and giving it as gifts. But you know, they they sent me um, a, a package and I opened it up and it it's all branded beautifully and tells a great brand story. And the first thing I open, it says, "From your zesty bestie," and it's such I a cute it. card. And I'm I'm so excited for them, and and I know that this episode especially is going to be really good for them to listen to about writing those sequences because that's one of their next next tasks <laughs> yeah. is to take that on. But yeah, just as you would send a thank you email, it's great to send a thank you card, and it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be super simple. Um, but that makes a difference. And if your product does need special care or, you know, special instructions, make sure those are in the package too. Um, and then after they've received it and are excited to use it, that's a great time to send another email and ask for a review or ask them to share, uh, with their, share about you with their friends. um, Yes. That's where the reviews keep coming. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Most of us don't go back and write reviews on our own unless we are prompted. So, (laughs) yeah. So, don't be shy. Ask for the review. Yes, absolutely. Well, these are awesome tips um, for people just starting out. And, you know, you can take as much or as little away from it and, 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 write, you know, five emails, but I guess at the very least, like, let's at least get one email done and, and, you know, start to nurture that, that customer, um, and get them, get them warmed up to you and excited. Um, sales doesn't have to feel icky. It can, like, we actually like buying from places where we want to buy the products, right? Where we're like excited. So make it a fun, engaging experience. Um, and that really starts on your website and with your email copy. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's what it's all about. <laughs> I love your, um, I want you to tell people where they can find you, but I, I think this is such a good example of um, brand story, brand identity, but also, um, you know, your website could just be, could just say like, get customers to follow you, but Oh, I love this line on your website. It says, get messages that draw in customers like the scent of fresh waffle cones on a summer afternoon. <laughs> Have you ever been walking past an ice cream shop and you can just... Yes. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I just love, I think that's such a good example of how um, copywriting, you know, using uh, different metaphors and vocabulary um, can really help like capture your customer's attention. So... Nice, nice job on that. So tell us, tell everyone where they can find you and how they can work with you. Yeah, I'm at AnnaKBradshaw.com. And so you can find my services there. You can get in touch with me there. Um, You can read the blog there. We have some articles on, you know, some of the things we talked about today and some other things that, um, you know, are helpful as you're just getting started and writing copy for your own brand. Awesome. Uh, so to, to wrap up, um, what would be one sentence of advice, one piece of advice you give to all the folks who are just thinking about starting or they're ready to take that brand that they, you know, they got going, it was at the farmer's market, it's good enough, but now they're ready to up level it and really take it to the next level. Yeah, I think my one piece of advice related to messaging 
is write like you'd talk to a friend. You can't go wrong when you are just being down to earth and direct as you talk to a friend. And when you're in those stages before you've got your whole brand voice guide determined, um, you know, when in doubt, just talk like you talk to a friend and in your Instagram posts and your emails and your website. That's such a great point. I mean, um, I love uh, Donald Miller's uh, story brand concept, and he always talks about writing uh, to a, f a fifth grade audience that you don't want to use words that are so complex that a fifth grader couldn't understand them. Um, and I think, I don't know why we do that in emails. And I mean, we're just so close to our product, I think. And as service providers, we're probably the most guilty <laughs> of this. But um, yeah, write in really simplistic language, something that is very easy to understand, very conversational. I mean, I would encourage people to go back and look at emails and brands and, and copy that they love. It is probably more in that conversational tone. Yeah, when in doubt, you can't make it too simple. You can make it too complicated and confusing. You can't make it too simple. Great piece of advice. Yes, I love it. Well, thank you so much, Anna, for joining us today. I think this is going to be so helpful to so many people just getting started and and launching that product, getting it on their website, and, and really nurturing their customers through email. Yeah, absolutely. And if anyone has questions, definitely send me a note. You can find my email address or just the you know, form on AnnaKBradshaw.com. I'd be happy to follow, uh, answer any follow-up questions. Wow, that was so good. I really enjoyed listening to that again after a few months of sitting on the shelf. I really appreciate Anna's time and her patience. But this this episode is so good and there's so many good gems in here. So I really hope you're willing to go back and take a look at least at one of your key email sequences or your homepage and be willing to look at it with fresh eyes through the lens of, are you really talking to your customer or, and are you keeping things simple? All right, you guys, until next time, have an amazing week. Are you ready to start that delicious idea that you make in your home kitchen or grow your existing packaged food business and take it to the next level? The most successful food business entrepreneurs have support, guidance, focus, and accountability to help them make it happen quickly without wasting time or money. Plus, I think starting your packaged food business should actually be fun. Food business success is your secret ingredient to creating your food business dream. Please don't go this alone. Check out the private free food business success Facebook group to connect with other foodpreneurs, get your questions answered quickly, share your wins and receive special training and tools I only share inside the private community. Just search for food business success on Facebook or get the link in the show notes curious about how food business success can help you, head over to foodbizsuccess.com and fill out the application to see if you're a great fit for the program. Together, let's make your food business dream a reality.